Well, today, as you know, we're, on, we're in part two on asking for a friend. I want to jump right into it here this morning. I ask you for a friend. The definition is it indicates that a question is embarrassing by pretending to be asking on behalf of another. Have you ever been there? Yeah, this is church, so you can be honest, okay? All right, so here we go. Let's try a few. Let me, let me read a few to you. Kind of funny. You ready? They won't be on the screen, so you just, you'll have to listen. Can you imagine that? In church, you actually have to listen and, and not be distracted by something you see. Isn't that something? Can you fry, okay, asking for a friend. Can you fry bacon with a hair straightener? Asking for a friend. Now, these are the top questions that I pulled off the internet. So if this is a question, somebody's been doing it. Okay. Can you put whiskey in a humidifier? Asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah. Some of you just laugh. You ain't laughing just at this. <laughs> All righty. Is it, okay, how long after waking up do you have to wait before taking a nap? 15 or 20 minutes asking for a friend. Okay. Is it okay to wear a Snuggie? to pick up your daughter from school, asking for a friend. Okay, what is the appropriate number, number of hours for a day for a grown-up man to spend trying to make a real lightsaber, asking for a friend? Come on, somebody knows it's true. Somebody, somebody knows it's true. I, you know, any Star Wars freaks in the house? All right. Does anyone know how many calories you burn standing on the bathroom scales crying, asking, <laughs> asking for a friend? Okay, now we ain't done yet. All right, here we go. All right. How long are you supposed to rest between workout sex, set, sets? Okay, okay. Maybe I should have put these up on the screen. <laughs> okay, S E T S. Okay. All right. Oh, All righty. Somebody say it's in the Bible. Hallelujah. All righty. So here we go. One more time. Oh, okay, I'm not even going to read that again. Okay. I'm not even going to read it again. Okay. Next one. Okay. <laughs> That was a good one. I could have read the rest of it, but y'all ain't going to get it. You ain't going to get it now. Okay. Do dogs only understand when you talk in high, weird baby voices? Asking for a friend. Last one. No, no, second to the last one. Can someone be incarcerated for like stealing four cute puppies? Asking for a friend. Cute, 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 cute. Okay. All righty. Last one, what does it mean if holy water sizzles when it lands on your spouse's skin? <laughs> Asking for a friend. All right. <laughs> Woo, 911 ain't gonna help you, baby. All righty, so, you know, in talking about this, you know, people are, many, today more than ever, people are more sensitive and, and many times quiet because they are afraid to ask questions. And this is where asking for a friend came from. You know, in our staff meetings in Florida, when we were pastors for years under Pastor Allen and Janice Spiegel here on the second row, wave y'all's hands so everybody knows I'm not talking about an apparition. All righty. So when we had our staff meetings in Florida, we would, you know, um, and, we, and, and we also had creative meetings on a, on a regular weekly basis. And we have them here also at Movement Church. And we always start the meetings like we did in Florida by saying, hey, there are no dumb questions. Have you ever heard, heard that before? You know, people said, no, 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 you ain't around my group yet. Well, what we did is we, we had to level, level the playing field and say there are no dumb questions because people will feel they can be criticized for saying something that's dumb or, 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 not, or not smart or doesn't really add to the conversation. And we decided we're going to change all that because you only release creativity when you release everything that you're about when you let your mind go free to say and to think and to do. You know, that's how you, do you realize that's how you are 
around your best, 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 best friend, you're free to say whatever comes to your mind. That's why, that's why you love being around your friends. You know, sometimes you wish you had friends that didn't do that. Somebody say amen. amen. Heard this uh, from, a, from a dear British pastor. Uh, his wife years ago said to me, a friend is one to whom you pour, the, all the, pour, you pour all the contents of your heart out, the wheat and the chaff together, knowing that only the gentlest of hands will take that which is good and with the breath of kindness blow the rest away. It's a real friend. You know, but that's, that's what it is. So, so, you know, Pastor Allen back at Family Bible would, would many times would have to strongly remind our pastors during these creative meetings because we would get back in, in, uh, in a critical mode when somebody would say something that was kind of weird or, or dumb in working out these messages we wanted to make, we wanted to, we wanted to do full on, we, we did full on sets and the Orlando, Orlando paper would call us and say, hey, let us know when you're doing a big theme service again because I mean, it was, it was a big deal. But in these sessions, we had to stop people from saying, that's dumb, that'll never work because when somebody says that to you, it crushes your spirit or it, it has the potential to, okay? So, as a result, as I mentioned, many people in the day we live in become silent, voiceless, nameless, because they're afraid of criticism for someone else, even especially on social media. All right. But Pastor Rod, you don't understand, they have a million followers. What, why, do I should, why should I even come in? Well, see, every one of us are going to stand before God one day, and I promise you, nobody is going to have a cell phone with them. It's, it's only you. It's only you. And as far as that goes right now, it's just you and God anyway. God's not looking at your cell phone. Okay, even if you are. All righty. So I said that to say this. What you have to say, how you feel, your life's experiences, your struggles, they all matter to God. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it's not on the screen. but It says, God is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Jesus says, there's not one little sparrow Danny, that falls to the ground that God don't know about it. And he said, you're of more value than many sparrows. So if he not notices the littlest thing about a mishap for a sparrow, he's concerned about you. Okay. Plus Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5 and 6 says, I am Yahweh, the only God there is, and you'll never find another. Right. By that, I'm just saying to you today is that if God cares He's the highest that there is. There is no one more that you need to be caring if God cares. He's the highest there is. There is none other. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? How many realize you've got the highest that there is already working with you today? Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so point number one today in, in uh, talking about asking for a friend. Number one, I just want to get this out there and let you guys know real strongly and, and just kind of nail this down again because you have to visit, revisit this every so often in your life because we get out of whack in the world that we live in. The scripture says that the pressures of the world will squeeze you into its mold. The uh, book of Romans says don't let that happen. Well, the only way you, you know, how many know you don't let, it, it's, it's impossible to not let something happen unless you do something stronger than that. Yeah, that's good. Let me say that again. Some of you are sleeping. Some of you didn't hear what I'm saying. How many know, you don't keep something from happening unless the force that you're pushing against it is stronger than the force that's pushing against you. That's what you got to do. So how do you do that? Scripture says by the word of God, by meditating on the word. You have, there's a lot of Christian people that are walking around on really short power. They're walking on, on really low joy. They're walking around on really low happiness and excitement because the forces of the world are pushing on them so strong. And sadly, we keep letting these entertaining, entertaining forces keep oppressing us, making us feel when there's, a, when there's a God bigger than all of that, more stronger, there's a word of God that wants to come alive on the inside of us and make that real. So point number one today is you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm, I love this verse in the Bible, Psalms 139 verse 14. I'm going to read it out of the NIV. It says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Everybody say full well. Now see, there's, a, there's two beautiful parts of this, and probably more than two, but two, I want to I I uh, say this. David said, I will praise you, Lord, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the first part. I mean, the, the second, I mean, first part we're going to put in this together. Your works are wonderful, but look at that last part. I know that full well. He had a full living experience of who God had made him to be. Now, many people know God made you, but you're not walking around with an experience that he did it. 
You're not, we're not walking around with experience of that identity. Letter A, under point number one, you said, just when preachers stopped using, started, didn't use many points, they start using letters too. Think about it. Okay, I want to share something with you. Letter A, criticism doesn't define you. Say that with me. Criticism doesn't define me. Okay, someone else's or your own. They don't define you. What does that mean? Nothing anyone says to you or about you. Now, this is going to shock you a little bit because it's going to seem like a lie. But it's not. Nothing anyone says to you or about you has the power to affect you in a positive or negative way unless you believe that it does. Nothing anybody says on the interwebs or something, a gesture that they make. I had somebody blow the horn at me for no reason behind me the other day at a traffic, at a traffic light. I wasn't doing anything wrong. And, but it wanted to connect with my belief system on the inside that they needed something that I had. It wasn't what the Lord wanted me to give them, but it was, they needed something that I had. I, I reached for the handle of the door to get out. And the Holy Spirit said, don't you even think about it. I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm not going to share the rest of the story. But anyway, the thing is, listen, listen. When people say things about you that make you feel like a loser or make you feel less than, you and I need to quit. We need to quit acting like what they say holds weight. Why? Because after all, they're human. They're created out of dirt, just like you. Just like you. I want to show you the, just one picture here of a boy. His name is Nick Wojcik. I want you to check out this picture. Uh, as you can see, he was, you know, born, you may have seen him before on, on his, he was born with no arms and no legs to uh, Australian missionaries. And he got, he got made fun of a lot, fun of, fun of a lot when he was a kid for uh, having, you know, no arms and no legs. And, he, and uh, every night he, he would cry a lot because people pointed, stared at him, laughed and made fun of him. And every night he would cry himself to sleep asking God, I heard his testimony, asking God to heal him. God, please heal me. But, he, but healing never came. And, you know, but he decided, there came a point in his life where he decided, I am not going to wait any longer for healing because all of a sudden he grabbed a hold of this verse that we just read in Psalms 139 verse 14. He realized God has fearfully and wonderfully made me just like I am. Now, think about that. Now, there may be some truth. There may be some faults to that. But to him to celebrate, he's the one God made. It's total truth. He began to celebrate it. And he began to go. He had it in his heart to go speak to people, to encourage them, who were, her, encourage people who were facing obstacles that they could overcome. He began to feel. Now he's spoken to hundreds of millions of people around the world. Hundreds of millions now, not just one or two, hundreds of millions. And he realized one day when the Lord spoke to him, he said, let me ask you something, Nick. The Lord spoke to him, he says, do you think if you stood up in front of all these people and said, I was born with no arms and no legs and God miraculously grew them out and I'm telling you this so that I can encourage you and strengthen you. What do you think is more powerful? Do you think people would believe you if you told them that happened? The chances are most of them would not but that you stand up here and you haven't received your miracle yet. And you're saying God did make me fearfully and wonderfully and I am the glory of his creation. And you're standing there and telling this to people and he raises up his little, gives everybody a wave. He calls it his chicken wing. He's got a little foot looking thing here that he wiggles and says hi to everybody and, he, and it helps him swim when he does backflips off, of, off of diving boards. Look at the second picture. This is his life today. See? So the question is, criticism doesn't define you. So are you going to let criticism define you? Think about it. Think about it. This is a person who did not let obstacles stop him. Who did not let what he had not received, a promise from God that he knows can come to him, but he has not re received it yet, he won't let that stop him. So I'm telling you today, will you let something you haven't received from God yet or something you haven't seen come to pass, are you going to let it make you sit in your mess and whine and complain and get critical about it? Are you going to get up 
with your chicken wing and go do what God has called you to do. Criticism doesn't define you. Point number two, education doesn't define you. Let me show you one picture of a little boy here. This little boy was born to be a hard worker, but he was born in poverty. And in the eighth grade, his father left, abandoned him and their family. And he had to quit school and begin working full time to take care of his family. And all he knew was to work with his hands and work construction. So little by little, he began to work and save his money and work and save his money. He worked for other men for a long time and learned how to, learned how to operate big machinery. Then one day, he took a leap of faith and stepped out and bought his own backhoe. Next, he bought another piece of equipment. And before you know it, this man with only an eighth grade education who was abandoned by a father that left him with nothing. He's, he is today a multi, well, he's gone to be with the Lord now, but he, he built a multi-million dollar business down in Coleman, Alabama un, of, with underground utilities and directional borers. And this is, his fa- this is his children and his grandchildren. And I'm proud to call him Papa. Why? Because a lack of education or education doesn't define you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. This man did not let the spirit of abandonment ruin his life. He realized, hey, yeah, I may not have been given a fair shake in this, but I know how to work. Education doesn't define you. Letter C, success doesn't define you. Success. Everybody say that with me, success. Success doesn't define you. The presence of success or the lack of it does not define you. Show you a picture of this group right here. Now look, this is probably, I don't know, 20 years or so ago. Uh, Jill, you may correct me on this, but, but this, is, uh, this is a group of my mom's, this is one year of my mom's music recital. Matter of fact, you can see me in the top right back there with actual hair. It might be, 20, okay, so it might be 25 years ago. Thank you, honey. Yeah. So um, this is a long time ago, and uh, some of my family are there. My mom's down on the front left there. But um, there's a young man in this picture who's he's not actually, he's performing in the recital, but he's not performing as a student. He's just performing, uh, he's playing the guitar for my brother, uh, who's a lifelong student. And um, so uh, let's, let's do the second picture there so you can see close up. So years later, it's the one on the top in the middle. Years later, we're, you know, I'm laughing, sitting in, a, in, the, in the TD Waterhouse Arena in Orlando. I'm laughing because I hear an announcer come over and announce this guy's name, and they say, introducing the overnight success. And I'm going, no, I start laughing. No, it ain't. No, he ain't. To you, he might have been. But right after this recital, right after that music recital that you, that you see, he handed Jill and I, this guy handed Jill and I a little CD with a Sharpie written on it. A little Sharpie written on it with a, with a song on it. And said, hey, when y'all go back down to Florida, if, if y'all see finding radio, radio stations that might want to play this song, would you, just, would you just look for it? Would you just, just give it to somebody? And there was a little CD, homemade CD in the garage, and on the front of it, it said chicken fried. See, when did God see that man as a success? That night at the TD Waterhouse Arena in Orlando? No. God saw him as a success when he was in his mother's womb because of Jesus. And that's how God sees you today. He doesn't need mankind to look at you who are also made of the same dirt you're made of to try to say, ooh, that dirt's prettier than this dirt. That dirt's more valuable than this dirt. That dirt's richer than this dirt. No, no, you're all dirt. (laughs) Every one of you are dirt. And the only difference between your dirt and somebody else's dirt is if you've allowed the creator of the universe to blow his breath on the inside of you. When you allow the breath of your creator to breathe on the inside of you, you become born again of incorruptible seed. Mm. 
Success doesn't define you. Amen? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Number two, it's time to ask God. Everybody say, ask God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, I'm, and I'm, I'm by no stretch am I an English teacher, but I understand some things about the English language. Ask right here means to, it, it's, it's, a, it's of a verb tense of present imperative action. That means it's an ongoing action. That means it keeps happening. So I'm going to read this to you. Uh, ask means to, to ask, request, petition, demand in a continual or ongoing manner. So I'm going to read Matthew 7 in the correct way that it's in the NLT. Check this out. New Living Translation. It's supposed, it's supposed to say this. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. In other, in other words, it's saying, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. I'm going to say something beautiful here that, I, that it hit me during study this week. This is a beautiful thing. Now, you've probably all heard this before, but it hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. Ready? Here's something beautiful. Whenever you're asking God for something, it always gets filtered. Has your kid ever asked you for Skittles, but you gave them an apple instead? And they enjoyed it. And as we know, it was more healthy for them. Come on now, don't everybody get quiet on me. You still do what's right for your kid, right? Four people are shaking their head. Sometimes when your kid wants to make, you know, we just kind of have a rule in our house. We do, we do let candy roll. But there's a certain point where there ain't no more candy rolling. And we stop and say, okay, from now till bedtime, if you're hungry, you're eating fresh fruit. All of a sudden, hunger leaves. But that's all right. That's all right. That fresh fruit is still there. And like Pastor Allen said, his dog didn't like coleslaw and green beans either till the third day. You know, sooner or later. <laughs> so, okay, sooner or later. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, that's Pastor Allen too. He said, "I one time I got so hungry I actually ate an apple." <laughs> you know. So, so. Uh, so there is a card in, in your seat back, in, your, in the back of your seat pocket, that I want each of you to take home today. It is a card that, we, that I've put in there of 50 things that I want you to ask God for. You say, are you kidding, Pastor Rod? No, no, I'm telling you the truth. Don't start now. Don't get distracted. Don't start now, you bunch of overachievers, okay? Put it in your Bible. Put it in your notebook. I want you to wear yourself out thinking of 50 things that you are needing God to do for you. Why? Because Matthew... Chapter 7, verse 7, Andrew says, ask and keep on asking and you shall receive. Keep and see, this is what I was telling you all ago, asking God for something, even if it's wrong. Why? Because the spirit of God will not give you something that hurts you. Why? How do you know that, Pastor Rod? I've seen people get blessed with big houses and all this stuff and they end up forgetting God. That's not God's blessing. That's because they made enough to go in debt that much. Or they made enough to pay for it. What do you mean? No, the scripture says a truth, the litmus test of the blessing of the Lord, is script, the scripture says, is the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich and adds no sorrow to it. God's blessing comes when you have a full supply and there's no sorrow connected to it. That's how you know. That's how you know. So, I want you to fill that thing up. If you ask God for the wrong thing, y'all please, your dust, your dirt, he already knows if you're weird. He already knows if what you're asking for and ain't never going to happen for you. What, what are you talking about, Pastor Rod? I'm talking your kids ask for stuff that there ain't no way they're ready to have yet. God, same way. You as a parent, Scripture says, if you being evil know how to good gifts, give good gifts to your kids, how much more does your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask. What are you talking? God says, if you know how to decipher right and wrong for your kids, I know how to decipher right and wrong for you. That's what God's trying to say. So in other words, I need you to write down 50 things and I want you to put that somewhere where you can look at it every day. Saying, Pastor Rod, are you telling us to do this? No, I'm commanding you to do this. You need to get God working on your behalf because some of, some of us have fallen to the wayside with asking God for things because you haven't seen him do something great in your life lately because you're not asking James chapter 4 says we don't have because we don't ask. Mm. Let me tell you something. When my children come up to me asking for things, do you think it makes me upset or makes me happy? It makes me happy. 
I want to. Why? Because I love that interaction. I love them knowing that I love to supply their needs. I love it. I love it. Mm. So real quick, on behalf of, the, uh, of all of our students in the house, young students, I need a couple people to help me with this uh, melodrama real quick. You didn't think I was going to just uh, do a grown-up message. Um, I need a King Solomon. I'll tell you what, I'm going I'm to switch stuff around a little bit. Mm, Ryan, Ryan Flowers, I want you to come up and be a King Solomon. Come and be a King Solomon. Hand him that crown if you would, Abby. Uh, Marnell, I want you to be a guard, a palace guard. Okay, come on up, Marnell, if you would. Hand me that hatchet there if you would, Abby. Yeah. I need a couple of girls to help me out. Let's see, who are they? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Tori, come and stand right here, right here on the corner. And uh, Danny, come on up here and stand right, right here on this corner. Uh, King Solomon, won't you come stand right here on the edge of the stage? Actually, you stand on this side of the stage. Guard, you're looking good today, brother. <laughs> you stand right here with this hatchet. Okay, now, if you would go ahead and would you give that baby to Danny? That's good. <laughs> it's a baby, Abby. Oh, my. Oh, <laughs> Have we not taught her anything, baby? Listen, I'm so glad we have a nurse practitioner in the house. Whew. That could have been, it could, it could have been, oh my goodness. Okay, so the scripture says that two women one day came to the palace because of the, this is not in any translation, but I have to say it because the other translation is not suitable for children, but two ladies of the evening came to, quit laughing, you're the children's pastor. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. Okay, it's okay to laugh. Just kidding. But the scripture says there were two ladies of the evening. They came to Solomon, and they each had, been, they each had give, given birth to a baby. But in the middle of the night, one had rolling over. Okay? So they're come, one rolled over and rolled on top of the baby and killed it. So, so just we're going to pick up right in there. And all of a sudden, here's what you got. Both of the girls come to see. Now, oh, let, me, let me back up a minute. Let me back up. I want to back up. There's a verse I want to share with you. King Solomon is before the Lord doing what we just, what I just asked you to do. He's asking God, he's saying, God, I have the heart of a child. I don't even have enough sense to, to, to know my way around, but I'm king of Israel and I don't know what to do. God said, why don't you ask me whatever, what, what is it that you want? Solomon said, God, I ask you for wisdom. Give me wisdom to lead your people. Give me smarts so that I can Judge right from wrong for your people. Your people are so awesome. I want to be a blessing to them and not a curse. God, help me to know right and wrong. Guess what? The scripture says, Jesus said, unless you come to him like a child, you won't see it or get into the kingdom of God. So Solomon confessed to God, God, I'm like a child. I don't know. Listen, if some of you are coming to God today and you forgot the child part, you need to repent. Why? Because Jesus said, unless you repent and become, go to square one and start again like a child, you won't get in. You won't see it. You won't get in. So some of you need to back it up. Because guess what? I don't care if you have 15 degrees behind your name. I don't care if you have a ton of money. I don't care if you have all these smarts. To God, you're still about as smart as a, I don't even know what to say, a nickel. You know? For real. Or do you understand? God don't love you because of all that you add to yourself. You claim, he loves you because you are his child. You're his creation, just like the way you love your child, okay? So, but, but way, 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 way better. So, the girls come to, the, the, the moms come to King Solomon. And one mom says, this is my baby. This is my baby. You can say it out there. You just point it out there. This is my baby. This is my baby. And the other mom, you turn right there. No, it's not. No, it's not. It is so not. It is so not. It's my baby. It's my baby. And she says, no, it's not. No, it's not. So they both turn around to the king and they say, King Solomon. King Solomon. Help us. Help us. We're desperate. We're desperate. King Solomon looks down at him and says, Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. Well, <laughs> the loudest mama, the loudest mama <laughs> looks up at King Solomon and says, Here's what happened. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, that woman, that woman rolled, over rolled over her big self, her big self. on her new baby, her baby 
We both had babies. Three days apart. She rolled over on hers. That poor baby died. She picked up that dead baby. Stuck it under my body. And then took my baby boy. And now she claims it's hers. She, and now this mama walks over to her and says, it is mine. A little bit louder. It is, mine. it is mine. And she tries to take it from her. And the king says, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Step back over here, lady. Step back. <laughs> king Solomon said, I know exactly what to do. I know exactly what to do. Both of you say, both of you say, both of you say. the baby belongs to you. The baby belongs to you. But Obviously, obviously, it only belongs to one. one. So here's what we're going to do. Guard! Guard. Come with your hatchet. Bring that hatchet. (laughs) Give the baby to the guard. Give the baby to the guard. So the mom reaches up and gives the baby to the guard. The king looks at the guard and says, cut the baby in half. Cut the baby. (laughs) So, no, no, let's, I tell you what, let's do it better. Let's do it this way so that, yeah. And the king says, and the king says, we will give each mama. We will give each mama. One half of the baby. So the guard raises up the hatchet high over his head. He's getting ready to deal the death blow. And all of a sudden, this mama over here says, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Just do it. Just do it. Split it in half. Split it in half. That'll be fair. That'll be fair. But this mama over here says, stop. Stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Give the baby to her. Just give the baby to her. I don't want that baby to die. I don't want that baby to die. Let that baby live. Let that baby live. And Saul and King Saul says, "Hold up. Hold on. Wait, a Wait a minute. Stop everything. Stop everything. Only the real mama. Only the real mama. The genuine mama. The genuine mama. Would want that baby to live. Would want that baby to live. Even if she couldn't have him. Even if she couldn't have." Give that baby to the real mama. mama. All right, give them a hand clap. Didn't they do good? (laughs) Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you. So, needless to say, you might want to put wisdom at the top of your list. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of knowledge, but it's knowing when to apply that knowledge. So listen close to me today. I just gave you a story there to help you understand the reason Solomon advanced in wisdom was the original gift that God gave him, but he had the heart of a child. And God said, Solomon, because you, because you didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for all the things that everybody asked for, I'm going to give you what you asked for, wisdom, and I'm going to add to you all the other things as well. Mm. So I'm telling you today, it's time for you to write a list. I'm going to call some of you. I'm going to text some of you and get you to show me a picture of your list. I'm going I'm to hold you accountable. And by the way, if you go ahead and make your list out to 50 and you have an idea, Michelle, that one of your girlfriends ain't got it, ain't got their 50 done, just ask him to look at it. Michelle would be a good person for to be accountable uh, to be accountable to. It just seems like she would be. I don't know her that well, actually, you know, person to person, but she just seems like she'd hold you accountable. How many know sometimes we need people to hold our feet to the fire? No, you do. How many know most of us won't do anything unless our feet is held to the fire? Why? Because less than 10% of the people in the world know how to manage themselves. I'm not giving you some wisdom. That's a fact. Less than 10% of the people in the world can manage themselves. That's why they're in management. Excuse me. No. 
93, about 90 something percent of the people in the world cannot manage themselves. Less than 10% of the people are the managers of the world. So step into that category today and write something down that you're believing God for. It cannot be wrong. Do you hear me? It cannot be wrong. I'll give you a perfect example. I was walking the property of a new property that we were believing God for with Pastor Alan and Janice in Central Florida. I walked that property many mornings asking God to give us that property so that we could build a church on. That never came to fruition. A couple years later, one morning on the way to work, I stopped early. Headed to, I was headed to construction. And I got out because I liked this property. Had grass all around it. Nobody was meeting church here. I got, got around and I felt like the Lord say, walk around that property and claim it. I said, Lord, why would I walk around that property? The last time I walked a property, nothing happened. And the Lord said to me, Roderick, in your heart, you may have been walking around that property, but in my heart, you was walking around this property. See, and you know, of course me, sorry, maybe nobody else would do this to the Lord but me. I said, Lord, where's that in the Bible? I'm sorry, y'all. I've just been taught that if you think God's speaking to you and it don't line up with scripture, then you may be just hearing a voice or you maybe have eaten too much pizza the night before or you may be whatever. All of a sudden, God spoke to me and said, do you remember Joshua? When, they were, when, they, when Jericho walls fell, he looked up at the sun and commanded the sun to stand still. He said, Joshua didn't know the sun's not moving. The earth is moving. He commanded the wrong thing, but the right thing happened. So you may be asking for something that you, you, you might not get, but you're going to get something better. You're going to get something your Father in heaven knows you need. Somebody say, come on. Last point of the day. Jesus lives to ask for a friend. John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves because the master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friend since I've told you everything the father told me. Hebrews 7, 25. Somebody say, I'm a friend of Jesus. Think about it. Jesus said, I'm not gonna, matter of fact, one translation says, I've never called you my slaves. I've only called you my friends. Look at this next verse. Hebrews 7, 25. Passion translation says this. So Jesus, he is able to save fully from now throughout eternity. Ooh, some of you come to church for this. You ready? He is able to save fully from now throughout eternity. Everyone who comes to God through him because he lives to pray continually to ask. One translation says he lives continually to ask for them. Jesus's job is asking for a friend. He lives to present you before the Father. As, that's why every promise of God in Christ Jesus for you is yes. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here today, you've never invited Christ to be Lord of your life, I'd love to give you that opportunity. If you never said yes to the one who formed the heavens and made the earth and everything in it, if you've never, if you've never had an opportunity to feel the love of God and to know that he cares about you and that he has a good plan for your life, I'd like to introduce you today to the one who loved the world so much. He made the greatest expression of love in all of, of history before time or will ever be, and that's he gave his one and only son so that the whole world, people that didn't care, people that did care, people that hated him, people that loved him, people that had no use for him, people that did. He gave his son up so that you could have everlasting life. If you're here today and you've never invited Christ to be Lord of your life, would you pray this prayer with me and this family here at Movement Church? I'd like to lead you in a prayer to invite Christ into your life. If you're here and you would like to receive and mean these words in your heart, let's pray together. Everybody say, dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Father, for giving the most precious gift so that I could have life, so that I could know your love, so that I could be who I was born to be. I repent of my sin. I believe you died on the cross 
that you rose again. Jesus, I declare you are my Lord. Forever, I will be in heaven with you. Thank you, Father.